Well, I'd like to welcome you all here to hear my talk on iodine. I've been involved in an iodine project with my mentor, Dr. Abraham, for about eight years now. And I'm on my fourth edition of my book, Iodine, Why You Need It, Why You Can't Live Without It. The research on iodine is growing at exponential bounds. And I have found iodine to be the single most important substance that um, treats a variety of illnesses and helps people achieve their optimal health more so than any other substance that I've been involved with in holistic medicine over the last 16 years. So today we will run through um, the highlights of iodine, how you can use it, um, how it can help you achieve your optimal health, and why everybody needs to really take a critical look at iodine and how important it is for your family to ensure that they have adequate iodine levels. So I thank you for coming and um, let's move on with it. So I'd like to start off with a quote by John Redmond Cox. Uh, he wrote this in 1800. The longer I live, the less confidence I have in drugs and the greater is my confidence in the regulation and administration of diet and regimen. I couldn't agree with him more. We're in the middle of a health care crisis right now. Um, President Obama is proposing a $1 trillion overhaul to our, to our health care system. And I say all of the administration's responses and Congress's responses and the Republicans and Democrats are wrong. They're not focusing on health. They're focusing on a disease model. Um, nowhere in medical school was I taught about health, what is it, and how to maintain it. I was taught about disease, the diagnosis of pathology, and how to treat that single diagnosis with a drug. Um, I say unless we start focusing on health, uh, we are moving down the wrong road in health care. And whatever solution the administration, Congress, Republicans, Democrats come up with is going to be the wrong solution. Um, so this lecture will be about health, how to optimize it, how to maintain it, and specifically focusing on iodine. So this is my, my newest book, Iodine, Why You Need It, Why You Can't Live Without It. It's, it's in its fourth edition. Um, and um, I put in there the highlights of iodine and why it's become such an important part of my practice. And I'm sure you'll find the information very useful for your personal lifestyles. So this was my professor in medical school, um, Professor Vader. <laughs> and I was always taught in medical school, just like he's saying on the slide, don't take iodine. Under any conditions, you don't need iodine. If you take iodine, you're going to precipitate a thyroid problem. If you have a thyroid problem and taking iodine, you're going to make that thyroid problem worse. Now, I was scared of iodine when I finished medical school, and I didn't want to use it, and I thought there was enough iodine and salt. Um, but boy, was I taught the wrong information about iodine. There's not enough iodine and salt. Um, 97, over 96% of the population is deficient in iodine, and iodine deficiency is associated with thyroid diseases, including autoimmune thyroid disease, thyroid cancer, breast diseases, including fibrocystic breast and breast cancer, um, autoimmune disease in general, and a whole host of other problems, including cancers of the ovaries, the uterus, um, and of course, the thyroid and the breast. So, Professor Vader was telling me don't take iodine, um, but uh, when I wrote my first edition of my book uh, on iodine, he read it and he wasn't feeling so well and he came to me and here's what he looked like when he came to me and you can see from this picture <laughs> that his hair had fallen out, he had these dark circles under his eyes, and um, he didn't look very healthy and he was grouchy and irritable and you know didn't really seem to like anything or anybody at that point and I tested an iodine level on him he was very low I put him on a small amount of iodine and here's the results his hair grew back he got color back to his face he became less irritable and if iodine can do this to Professor Vader iodine can ha certainly help you in your lifestyle so I'd like to start off with quoting my mentor in iodine, Dr. Abraham, who, who, who developed a term called medical iodophobia. It's the unwarranted fear of using and recommending inorganic non-radioactive iodine within the range known from the collective experience of three generations of clinicians to be the safest and most effective amounts for treating the symptoms and signs of iodine deficiency somewhere between 12 and, and 50 milligrams per day. Now, the RDA for iodine, or the RDI, you know, the new term for it, is about 150 micrograms per day. That's 100 to 500 times lower than what Dr. Abraham has coined here. And 
either Dr. Abraham is way off base or the RDA is way off base. And I'll side with the RDA being way off base and I'll show you the research behind that. So this is the illness that's affecting medical students, it's affecting residents, it's affecting doctors, it's affecting the public, it's affecting the media. Once we overcome this medical iodophobia illness, then we can be comfortable with taking iodine and ensuring we all have adequate iodine intakes. Edgar Cayce, the sleeping prophet, said there are only four elements in the body, water, salt, soda, and iodine. If we have adequate amounts of these four elements in balance, the body is fully capable of creating all the other elements of the universe. I couldn't agree with Mr. Casey more. Um, we need adequate hydration. We need the right kind of salt in the diet. And if you're not taking an unrefined salt, by my definition, you're salt deficient. Salt deficiency leads to problems with the thyroid, the adrenals, the immune system. You can't detox without adequate amounts of salt. I'll talk, touch on salt in this lecture, but I have another talk on salt and another book on salt, if you're interested more in that. Um, you need adequate amounts of iodine, which we're going to talk about now. And what I think he meant by soda was perhaps uh, you need your one Diet Coke a day. Um, if it's not Diet Coke a day, uh, he could have been referring to getting the pH balanced um, with bicarbonate of soda, which is what I think he was actually referring to here. So this is a thyroid ultrasound report on a patient where I palpated some nodules in her thyroid. I sent her for an ultrasound. And the ultrasound it reads here that one of the nodules is greater than one centimeter in size. And anything greater than one centimeter in size is sent for a biopsy to rule out thyroid cancer. This patient didn't want a biopsy for thyroid cancer. She was very iodine deficient. I put her on iodine. Um, you can see the data in this is 5 of 04. Bet between 5 of 04 and 11 of 04, this next ultrasound, it's, the impression was previously described nodules not identified in the current exam. This never happened to me until I started using iodine in my practice. Iodine deficiency causes cysts. If, if it goes on, the cysts become nodular. If it goes on, the nodular cysts become fibrotic. If it goes on, the fibrotic cysts become cancer. And this occurs in the thyroid, the breasts, the uterus, the ovaries, and probably the prostate. Um, and all the endocrine tissues can form cancer like this. The only cure for this is iodine deficiency. Um, so this is a routine in my practice now where ultrasounds of the breasts and the ovaries and the uterus and the prostate showing nodules and cysts and enlargements and, and irregular tissue become normal between six months and a year later. And only iodine can do this. No drug can do this. No other nutritional therapy can do this. So I was taught in medical school, don't give them iodine. <clears throat> if they have thyroid problems, the iodine's going to make it worse. If they don't have thyroid problems, you're going to precipitate it. Well, this study showed that Compared to normal thyroid tissue, benign thyroid nodules contain only 56% of the iodine content as the normal thyroid tissue. They also showed that malignant thyroid nodules contain only 3% of the iodine content as compared to normal thyroid tissue. If iodine were causing nodules and causing malignant tissue, you would expect the opposite to occur. Now, it's not just iodine. I don't suggest that you go and start using iodine alone. I suggest you work with a healthcare provider knowledgeable with iodine. But it needs to be used as part of a holistic treatment regimen, and one of the things is selenium. Um, so in this study, malignant thyroid nodules contain only 68% of the selenium content as compared to normal thyroid tissue. If we have time in this talk, I'll show you the relationship between selenium and iodine and why they should frequently be used together for thyroid problems. This is the periodic table. We're going to focus on group 17, the halides, fluoride, chloride, bromide, and iodine. So the, the history of iodine, it was first discovered in 1811, is known as the birth of Western medicine. Boos and Galt in 1824 observed that goiter did not occur in silver mining sites, and he also observed that those that came into the silver mining sites with goiter, when they would drink the water from the mines, their goiter would go away. Now he ascertained the substance in the mine was iodine that was causing the goiter to go away. He wrote an article about it. He suggested anyone with goiter to use iodine, or iodine containing water, or iodine containing salt. Now, it was really the first time that a single item iodine was recommended for a single problem goiter. And as I previously mentioned, what was I taught in medical school? I was taught how to make a diagnosis and how to prescribe the one drug to treat that diagnosis. So therefore, iodine is known as the birth of Western medicine as Boos and Galt recommended iodine for treating goiter back in 1824. Now, unfortunately, it took the United States 100 years to heed his advice. Um, so I always make the statement that the FDA is 100 years behind what's really true out there. Um, and nothing has really changed in the last couple of hundred years. 
So the RDA for iodine, I'm not sure if the RDA stands for rats, drugs, and assumptions, or really dumb advice. But the RDA for iodine is probably for rats, drugs, and assumptions because it's enough for rats to maintain normal thyroid function and to give iodine for the rest of their tissue. But it's certainly not enough for us humans in the toxic environment we live in today, and I'll show you that. But here's the RDA for iodine, about 150 micrograms a day for the adult male and female, a little bit more for pregnancy and lactation. Now, iodized salt was introduced in the United States in the 1920s to prevent goiter. Since that time, conventional medicine has been adamant. There's enough iodine in salt. You don't need to supplement anybody with iodine. Now, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey is done by the U.S. government every 10 years, and they look at a cross-section of about 8,000 people. They draw various vitamin mineral, vitamin, mineral, and some toxic element levels, and they extrapolate those numbers out nationally. From 1970 to 2000, the government's own data showed iodine levels declined 50% in the United States. So we need to think about that. We've had iodized salt the whole time. Why has iodine level declined 50% and what are the consequences of that? During this time that iodine levels declined 50% in the United States from 1970 to 2000, there's been significant increases in the incidence of all the thyroid illnesses, thyroid cancer, autoimmune thyroid disorders such as Hashimoto's and Graves' disease, as well as hypothyroidism just the opposite of what I was taught in medical school since they said that iodine caused these problems. Well, during the same time iodine levels have fallen 50%, cancer of the breast, prostate, endometrium, and ovaries, all increasing at near epidemic rates, particularly for breast and prostate, those are at epidemic rates across the United States, as one in seven women have breast cancer, one in three men have prostate cancer. Now, all of those ab of conditions can be caused by iodine deficiency. Again, pretty much the opposite of what I was taught in medical school. The proportion of the U.S. population with moderate to severe iodine deficiency, as, as defined by the World Health Organization, has increased 400% in the last 20 years, from 2% in, in 1970 to about 11.7% in, in 1990. In 2000, it was up to 16.8%, moderately to severely iodine deficient. And where are we in 2009? And this graph can give you an idea of where do you think things are going if we don't make some changes. This is why I think the health care plan is just doomed to fail. We're, we're missing the basic tenets of health care, which is diet, um, diet and exercise, and nutritional support for the body. So this is an article from Family Practice News, a recent article. Many pregnant women may be deficient in iodine. So the authors go through these studies that I've just quoted for you, and they make a claim that more than 70% of women with access to dietary iodine may remain at risk for unrecognized iodine deficiency during pregnancy. I'll show you that this unrecognized iodine deficiency risk is leading to lower IQ scores, more ADD, more health problems in our children, and it's going to compound the problems as they age. So... This was, a, this was a fairly new study, and what the authors did was look at three groups of children. Group one were supplemented with iodine at 200 micrograms per day, um, which is the, the RDI for iodine um, for pregnancy. And they were supplemented at 200 micrograms per day at four to six weeks of gestational age, so the mothers were, mothers were just pregnant. Group two, the mothers were supplemented with the same amount of iodine at 12 to 14 weeks of gestational age, so the second trimester. Group three. They were not given iodine supplementation during the whole gestation, gestation. They were supplemented with the same amount of iodine after delivery. All the children were given a neurocognitive evaluation at 18 months of age. Um, and all the, all the groups, all the mothers were supplemented with iodine until the end of lactation. So here's the data on this study. Um, group three we'll start with first. These were the group of women not supplemented with iodine until after pregnancy. You can see from this slide that the first and the second columns, less than 0.82 thyroid hormone, were uh, make up about 40%. So about 40% were moderately low in thyroid hormone in these babies that were not supplemented with iodine. So on this next slide, you can see that none of the group two mothers who were supplemented with iodine at, after the first trimester had low levels of thyroid hormone. And here's the group one, and none of them were also low in thyroid hormone. In fact, they were better than the group two. So you could see the earlier the mothers were supplemented with iodine, the better the baby's thyroid hormone was. Now, the more important study, more important graph is this one, the mean IQ. And you could see from group one to group two to group three, the decline in IQ, the later iodine was given in pregnancy. Now group one has a normal IQ, or slightly above normal, it's over 100. 
Group two, over 90. Um, group three, they were very low in IQ. And these people are going to have big trouble through the life. They're going to have trouble maintaining jobs. They're going to have trouble getting through school. And they're going to be more likely to be in the public dole. So the earlier you take iodine, the better the baby's IQ is going to be. It's important to ensure we have adequate iodine intake in our youth before women are pregnant and even in our kids before they start reaching adolescence and maturity. Now the author summarized this by saying a delay in six to ten weeks of iodine supplementation of slightly low uh, thyroid mothers at the beginning of gestation increases the risk of neural developmental delay in the progeny. So the, what the authors are saying is we need to supplement people with iodine before they're pregnant. So wh why look at iodine? Its, it's deficiency is a worldwide problem. Its deficiency causes mental impairment, reduced intellectual ability, ADD, autism, goiter, infertility have been associated with low iodine, as well as increased risk of all the, all the hormonal-based cancers, breast, prostate, endometrium, ovaries, as well as other cancers of the body. The newborn thyroid gland only holds a 24-hour reserve of iodine. Therefore, fresh sources must be supplied in the diet. Where's a newborn going to get iodine from? He's going to get it from his mother if she's breastfeeding, or he's going to get it from formula. There's not enough iodine in formula, and I'll show you that most mothers are deficient in iodine. Now, breast milk iodine. 47% of women sampled may be providing insufficient iodine to meet the infant's requirements. This was a recent study. Here's another study. 13 breastfeeding women were looked at. Um, 12 of 13, 92% had inadequate iodine in the breast milk. This was done in the U.S. And this was done recently. 69% um, of the breast milk samples were high in a substance called perchlorate. Perchlorate is a byproduct of rocket fuel and some other manufacturing processes. Right now, the companies that make perchlorate just dump it into our water supply. It's all over the place. Um, perchlorate has been found on um, crops grow, irrigated with perchlorate-laden water, which is usually Southern California and the Colorado River Basin. That's pretty much where we get all our winter vegetables and winter fruit supply from. And they've shown that these vegetables and fruit have been high in perchlorate. Between 1965 and 1980, the U.S. milk iodine content increased by 300 to 500 percent. That was from changes in cattle feed. By 1986, the amount of iodine was limited to 10 milligrams per cow per day. And here's what happened to um, iodine content in dairy milk. And you can see from a high of 602 micrograms per liter in 1978, recent measurements less than 100. It's no wonder that 96 percent of us are iodine deficient when you start looking at this data. So why iodine? The World Health Organization claims iodine deficiency is the world's greatest single cause of preventable mental retardation. They estimate there are 300 million school-age children worldwide who are iodine deficient. It encompasses a third of the world's population and 129 countries, including our own. There's decreased childhood survival rate in iodine deficient areas, and neonatal mortality has been shown to decline over 50% when iodine deficiency is rectified. Presently, 72% of the world's population, including the United States, is affected by iodine deficiency. Recent study from thyroid, the journal Thyroid, 100 consecutive healthy pregnant Bostonians, 50% found to believe, be below the RDA for iodine, 9% below 50 micrograms per day of intake of iodine, which is what the World Health Organization claims is severe iodine deficiency. Now, there is a definite correlation between lower iodine and autism. As similar to the U.S., a pattern of iodine decline in a population that can commit an increase in autism has been seen in other countries. We've seen this incredible rise in autism over the last 10 years in the U.S. The same thing has happened in England, New Zealand, and Australia, and other Western countries. And many researchers think it's due to iodine decline. Sixteen women from an iodine deficient area of Italy compared to seven women from a higher iodine area. They were looked at while they were pregnant. The women from the iodine deficient area had reduced T4, that's thyroid hormone, a decrease in free thyroid hormone with elevated TSH in 50% of pregnant women. The authors hypothesized that the imbalance of maternal thyroid hormone homeostasis during pregnancy as a consequence of endemic iodine deficiency may be responsible for the impaired psychoneurological development observed in children from that area. Appropriate iodine and or thyroxine prophylaxis to women in that region may prevent the neural, behavioral, cognitive, and motor compromise of that population. I think it's a travesty that 16% um, of public school-age boys are on some mood-altering drug right now. Where were these huge percentages of public school-age boys that needed mood-altering drugs when I was a kid? Nobody was on these things. Something has happened in our environment um, to cause this behavioral change and 
this, uh, this mood change that we're seeing in our young people, and I say it's iodine deficiency. Another study, 16 women living in an iodine deficient area versus 11 women living in an iodine sufficient area. 10 years of follow-up. What the authors found was that ADD was diagnosed in 11 of 16 in the iodine deficient area versus zero in the iodine sufficient area. The more telling number was the IQ was lower in the iodine deficient area, 88 versus an IQ of 99 in an iodine sufficient area. Now, I went to the University of Michigan. Um, I can guarantee you an IQ of 88 won't get you into the University of Michigan, but it gets you into places like this. And there's many Cretans in this place, and here's an example of a Cretan. They have these big heads, these, these silly-looking eyes, and the stupid grin on their face. Um, this is a sign of iodine deficiency. If you see this, run the other way and give them iodine. This, on the other hand, is iodine sufficiency. Um, and um, last year, Michigan did not have a good football season. Coach Rich Rod forgot to give the team iodine. He assured me this year the team would take iodine. So we're looking for a better production from our football team. So what about iodine and, and cardiomyopathy? 61 patients with dilated cardiomyopathy. The dilation of the heart, which is what cardiomyopathy is, was significantly correlated with thyroid gland volume. Therefore, the larger the thyroid, the more the problems they had with the heart. 97% of the patients showed goiter. Um, what's the most common cause of goiter known to mankind? It's iodine deficiency. Now, the, the correlation between cholesterol and iodine is pretty rock solid for those who are going to look at it. Um, conventional medicine would have you believe that elevated cholesterol levels is just a deficiency of a statin drug. And as I wrote in my book, Drugs That Don't Work and Natural Therapies That Do, statin drugs need to be avoided. I don't think anyone needs to be on them. I think they're the wrong therapy. If cholesterol levels are truly elevated, you need to search for the underlying cause of why cholesterol levels are elevated. Many times it's a diet and nutritional problem, and I'll tell you many times it's an iodine deficiency problem. Now, the whole cholesterol equals heart disease hypothesis started in the early 1900s when a researcher demonstrated that feeding rabbits cholesterol caused them to develop atherosclerosis in the same pathology that humans develop atherosclerosis. Now, that's where the whole train started, that cholesterol equals atherosclerosis. And that's why we have drugs now to lower cholesterol levels. Um, but a few years after the researcher reported that study, they redid the study. They fed iodine to rabbits, and then they fed them cholesterol. And they found that the iodine would prevent the deposition of cholesterol in the arteries of rabbits that were fed cholesterol. These same studies were reproduced in literature four times over the years. So here's one of the studies. Rabbits fed a high cholesterol diet. A treatment group of rabbits fed a high cholesterol diet and treated with either uh, T4, which is levothyroid or synthroid, desiccated thyroid hormone, which is armor thyroid or nature thyroid, and iodine. Now, the control rabbits fed cholesterol developed marked atherosclerosis, just as the previous studies showed. However, the rabbits fed a high cholesterol diet and thyroid hormones showed slight to moderate. The rabbits fed a high cholesterol-rich diet and either desiccated thyroid hormone or iodine showed an absence of atherosclerotic lesions. So this study showed that iodine has an independent positive benefit in a cholesterol-rich diet, as well as a synergistic effect with desiccated thyroid hormones, such as armor thyroid or nature thyroid. I say we missed the boat on this cholesterol equals heart disease hypothesis. It's not a statin deficiency syndrome. It's an iodine deficiency syndrome, coupled with other nutritional deficits. Now, in another study, rats fed an iodine deficient diet versus an iodine sufficient diet. The iodine sufficient diet resulted in a much lower thyroid weight, um, about four times lower. <clears throat> When the rats were fed a high cholesterol diet, the thyroid weight significantly increased in both groups. The high cholesterol diet was found to increase the body's excretion of iodine. So think about this. We live in a, in a very wealthy Western society. Like all wealthy Western societies, we eat more cholesterol in our diet than societies that aren't as wealthy. Now, if you're iodine deficient, um, these high cholesterol diet causes you to release more iodine. You become even more iodine deficient. They need more iodine. We need more iodine than what the RDA says. So iodine deficiency in rats has been shown to result in a subclinical hypothyroid picture, slightly elevated TSH with normal thyroid hormones. And despite normal T3 levels, which is the active form of thyroid, heart tissue was found to be deficient in T3. The T4 therapy, such as levothyroid or synthroid, was unable to correct the cardiac deficiency when there was iodine deficiency present. What they're saying here is you've got to correct the underlying problems, in this case, iodine deficiency, before you give them thyroid hormone. And I find the same thing with my patients. 
the worst thing you can do in a hypothyroid patient is give them thyroid hormone when they need iodine first. So I correct the iodine deficiency problem first or whatever the underlying problem is, and then wait, wait a little bit and see if they do need thyroid hormone after that. Many times they don't. 136 subjects. They were looked at for iodine intake and lipid parameters. Compared to iodine-sufficient non-goitrous controls, iodine-deficient goitrous subjects had significantly higher average cholesterol levels and LDL cholesterol levels. <clears throat> now, it's nice that we have drugs to treat all these elevated LDLs, but that's, we don't have an LDL drug deficiency problem going on here. We have iodine deficiency going on. You need to treat the underlying problem first. Ansel Keys in 1958 published data that the countries with the highest cholesterol levels had the highest rate of cardiovascular disease. Now, he, drew, he had a graph that he presented, and he became the toast of the United States, and the graph showed more cholesterol in your diet, the more deaths from heart disease. It was a pretty one, clear one-to-one -one correlation. However, he, he manipulated the data, and I described this more in my Drugs That Don't Work book, if you're interested more about this. But at the time that he wrote this, Finland had the highest rate of cardiovascular disease mortality in Europe. It was more prevalent in Eastern Finland than Western Finland. And the, the question was why? Um, researchers looked at a variety of dietary components. They looked at 47 different items studied. And what they found was that iodine intake showed the greatest statistical difference between Eastern and Western Finland. The risk of death from heart disease was 353% higher in individuals with goiter. There was also a significant lo lower death age in those with goiter. I mean, they died at an earlier age if you had a swollen thyroid. What's the most common cause of goiter? By far, iodine deficiency. Now, Finland doesn't wait 100 years like we do here. In 1970, the researchers relooked at 21 Finnish cities um, and the cardiovascular diseases as it related to uh, trace elements in the drinking water. And they looked at calcium, chlorine, fluorine, bromine, and iodine. The endpoints were heart disease, as shown in this slide. But the strongest correlation was iodine, the highest intake of iodine associated with the lowest rates of cardiovascular disease. So Finland markedly increased iodine intake in its population by adding more to dairy feed and more to animal salt. And the results were, in the past several decades, their cardiovascular mortality has decreased by 50, over 50%. Life expectancy has increased by five years. Finland currently has the highest iodine intake of any European country. That's what we should be doing here. So let's, let's look at a recent study, um, 2009, on iodine and lipid profiles. 262 children were studied in Morocco. They were studied from an iodine deficient area. They all had slightly elevated TSH, still in the normal range, but slightly elevated. They were given 400 milligrams of iodine orally. Remember, that's way above the, uh, the, the RDA for iodine. And after six months of taking this single dose of iodine, they found the TSH came down into much better normal ranges. The C-peptide level improved. Now, the C-peptide level is a measure of insulin release in the body, or we use this as a marker for diabetes. And their lipid parameters, the LDL over HDL ratio, fell from 3.3 to 2.4 in these children. So the author summarizes by saying correction of iodine-associated subclinical hypothyroidism improves the insulin and lipid profile and may reduce the risk for cardiovascular disease. I couldn't echo it anymore. We need to look at the underlying problems with cardiovascular disease. It's not a statin deficiency syndrome. And many times it's an iodine deficiency syndrome and other nutritional problems. Now what about prenatal vitamins? I told you women need to be um, treated with iodine before their pregnancy. So the kids, so the babies will develop with normal iodine levels and develop normal brains. Well, you would think prenatal vitamins would have iodine. Here's a headline from Family Practice News within the last few months. Most prenatal multivitamins lack adequate iodine. Um, this gentleman heard my lecture, Mr. Pyle, and he, he was in the Army, and he says, golly, how could that be? And hopefully you're saying the same thing to yourself. How could most prenatal vitamins lack iodine? Only 28% of prescription prenatal vitamins presently contain iodine. The average iodine content of the iodine-containing prenatal vitamins was found to be below the RDA for iodine. And of the prenatal vitamins that do contain iodine, only 15% have more than 150 micrograms, which is the RDA for iodine per daily dose. I say it's a public health di disaster that's unparalleled and ongoing, and nobody seems to want to stop it. Yet they want to push this health care trillion-dollar overhaul through when this would cost pennies compared to that. So, iodine. It's a fabulous substance for elevating pH. 
it's a great alkalinizing substance. The sicker somebody is, generally the more acidic they are. Taking iodine can elevate your pH. An elevated pH or normal pH helps you absorb minerals better, helps you absorb vitamins better, helps your metabolism better, helps you feel better, helps you with energy production. Um, I check pHs on my patients all the time. Its deficiency causes intellectual deficiency, goiter, hypothyroidism, autoimmune thyroid illness, thyroid cancer, as well as other cancers. It's necessary for the production of all the thyroid hormones, T4, T3, T2, T1. The 4, 3, 2, and 1 refer to how many iodine molecules are on that thyroid, thyroid globulin hormone. It's necessary for the production of all the hormones of the body, the adrenals, the ovaries, the testicles. All the hormones of the body need adequate amounts of iodine. <clears throat> and iodine is also responsible for the formation of the normal architecture of the glandular tissue. That includes the breast, the thyroid, the ovaries, probably the prostate, even though the studies haven't been done. And what about cigarette smoking for those who smoke? Well, the problem with cigarette smoking is you, in, you get cyanide into your body. It's met quickly metabolized to thiocyanate. Now, thiocyanate is a molecule that blocks iodine absorption into the glands of the body. And what they found in this study was the mean breast milk of iodine was nearly four times higher in non-smokers as compared to smokers. And I've been telling you, most people are iodine deficient. Now I'm telling you smokers are four times lower than non-smokers, and everybody's deficient. So the most misunderstood nutrient, iodine. Its trace element is found in small amounts in the human body. Um, it's usually found in seawater and sea organisms, such as seaweed. And the soil near the ocean can contain large amounts of iodine. Therefore, plants grown in iodine-containing soil will have adequate iodine levels. And I, we know iodine combined with salt when we get iodine salt. So the therapeutic actions of this most misunderstood nutrient is that it is a wonderful alkalinizing agent. It has antibacterial properties. In fact, no bacteria has been shown to be resistant to iodine. It has anti-cancer properties. It can turn cancer cells from rapidly dividing cells that don't stop to normal cells that have a life cycle and die. No fungus has been shown to be resistant to iodine. No parasite has been shown to be resistant for iodine. No virus has been shown to be resistant for iodine. Also, it's a great detoxifying agent for mercury, aluminum, arsenic, bromine, fluoride, plus other things. And it's a wonderful mucolytic agent. Not bad for the most misunderstood supplement that all medical students, all physicians are pretty much told don't prescribe. Of course, they're told don't prescribe, and nobody needs it, but nobody's checking levels either. But that's another story, and we'll get to checking iodine levels. So this person is Doc Brown. He was a very smart man. He built a time machine a few years ago. And he says, great, Scott, maybe we should all be using iodine. I couldn't agree with with uh, Doc Brown anymore. <clears throat> so what are the conditions treated with iodine? Here's a who's who of who's not feeling well and why we need, you know, why President Obama is proposing a trillion dollar overhaul for our health care. All these conditions on this slide can be related to iodine deficiency. ADD, asthma, atherosclerosis, all the breast diseases, cancer of the breast, the ovaries, the prostate, the thyroid, cerebral palsy, COPD, diabetes, Dupuytren's contracture, excess mucus production, hypertension, infections, keloids, all the liver diseases, nephrotic syndrome, ovarian cysts, parotid duct stones, peronies, preeclampsia, sebaceous cysts, all the thyroid disorders, hypothyroid, autoimmune, as well as thyroid cancer. Not bad for one most misunderstood nutrient. So iodine's not very soluble in water, and Lugol in 1829 found that when potassium iodide was added to water, it increased the solubility of iodine. He came up with Lugol's solution, 5% iodine and 10% potassium iodide in distilled water. Two drops of Lugol's contain about 12.5 milligrams of a combination of iodine and iodide. He developed this in the early 1800s. Lugol's solution it was widely used in, in medicine and just in people in general in the 1800s and early 1900s. Um, it was recommended for almost any condition, including infection, and it was probably the most used medical item before patent medicine took hold. Once patent medicine took hold after World War II, Big Pharma really had no use for iodine since it was such a cheap substance and couldn't be patented. Now, this is what I was using originally in my practice about 17 years ago, SSKI. One drop of SSKI was 50 milligrams of iodine. But I didn't do my homework, and I didn't look at what else was in SSK, which is glycerin, ethanol, and acetone. Um, 
And if I would have known that, I wouldn't have used it, and I shouldn't have used it. But I was using starting people at a drop a day, which is um, about 500 times the RDA for iodine. <clears throat> and I didn't see any negative effects with using a drop a day, but I didn't see any positive effects. I would go up to people with 0.3 cc's three times a day, which is about 150 to 200 milligrams a day, again, way above the RDA for iodine. Um, I wasn't seeing negative effects. I just wasn't seeing positive effects with it. Um, I'll show you why in a, just a couple slides of why I wasn't seeing those positive effects with that kind of iodine. So there is iodine in desiccated thyroid or armor thyroid and nature thyroid. There's about 0.2%, and if you multiply it out times one grain of thyroid, you get about 120 micrograms of iodine in it. However, this iodine is organified iodine. It's already bound to thyroid hormone. It ha really has no use for the rest of the body. Um, and that's not the type of iodine we're talking about. So just back here to remind you what the RDA for iodine, remember it's for rats, drugs, and assumptions. It's enough for baby rats to get enough iodine, but certainly not enough for us human folk. So iodine's a rare element, 62nd in abundance of the elements of the earth. It's at the bottom third of the elements in terms of abundance. <clears throat> the reduced form of iodine is known as iodide. It has an extra electron in its outer shell, which gives it a full complement of electrons. This next slide shows you um, iodine, the oxidized form of iodine. You can see here that it's lacking an electron in its outer shell. So iodide, D-I-D-E, would just have an extra electron paired with that one in its outer shell. That's the two differences between the two. What I didn't know when I was using the wrong kind of iodine was that different forms of iodine bind to different tissues. I was taught in medical school, if you take iodine in, that the stomach will manufacture iodine or iodide depending on what the body needs. In my clinical experience, it's clearly not true. We know different tissues combine to different areas of, uh, different tissues bind different kinds of iodine. Iodine, the oxidized form, binds to the breast, the prostate, and the stomach. Iodide, the reduced form, thyroid, salivary glands, and skin. Now, I know for those of you who are not chemistry majors or have a chemistry background, you know, your eyes are crossing a little bit, reduced and oxidized. But the take-home message is, if you're going to use iodine in any form, use a combination of iodine and iodide because you'll hit more parts of the body with it. And clinically, people do significantly better with a combination of iodine and iodide versus just using one form alone. So every cell in the body contains and utilizes iodine. The white blood cells can't effectively guard against infection without adequate amounts of iodine. It's concentrated in the glandular system of the body, thyroid, the ovaries, the uterus, the prostate, the endometrium. Now, the thyroid gland contains the largest amount of iodine at saturation, um, 50 milligrams. The breasts, the salivary glands, the parotid glands, the pancreas, cerebral spinal fluid, brain, stomach, skin, the eye glands also contain significant amounts of iodine. Iodine is transported across the cell via this Symporter. It's called the sodium iodine symporter, and you can think about it like a little car that just drives iodine across the border into the cell. Now, maximally, you can transport 600 micrograms per day of iodine into the thyroid gland. So let's think about that number, 600 micrograms per day. That's four times the RDA for iodine. So if you want to maximize iodine intake into the thyroid gland, um, the RDA isn't even sufficient to do that. That's why I say it's for, truly for rats. Now, at saturation, if you have enough iodine head to toe, about one and a half to two grams is stored in the body at sufficiency. The fat tissue stores the most, the muscle tissue stores second most, the thyroid is there for comparison. But the thyroid has the highest concentration of iodine. Every organ and all tissues contain iodine. The first iodine studies were done in the U.S. by David Marine. Now, in the, in the turn of the 20th century, as the population was expanding from east to west, um, there was an epidemic of goiter going on, particularly in the Midwest. And the, the, it wasn't just people that were getting goiter. Animals were getting goiter. Animals weren't growing to the right size, and they were having problems procreating the animals. So the U.S. government was beginning to worry that the population was going to outstrip the food supply as we expanded from east to west. Now, this was particularly evident in the Midwest, where I, where I live, in Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, um, and David Marine was a medical student who wrote a paper on iodine, and he became the de facto um, expert on iodine. 
the government called him in to look at the animal population and the animal problems with goiter and not procreating correctly. So he knew about the earlier studies from Boussingault in the 1800s, and he put various amounts of iodine in animal feed, and he looked at the results of the animals. And what he found was a certain amount of iodine would prevent goiter. The animals would grow to the right size. They would procreate correctly. And he published an article on it. Um, and the government asked him to look at people because people were suffering from goiter at epidemic rate. His first study was Akron, Ohio. Why did he choose Akron, Ohio? Well, number one, that's where he was from. But number two, 56% of school age girls had goiter at the turn of the 20th century in Akron, Ohio. There was a higher incidence of puberty. The reason there was a higher incidence of puberty was the first tissue that forms a puberty is breast tissue. The breasts have a high concentration of iodine, um, just like the thyroid and just like the ovaries do. And at puberty, a girl's iodine requirements go through the roof compared to a boy's because the boy doesn't have as much breast tissue and, and, the, and doesn't have as much iodine requirement. There was a 600% increase in goiter in girls versus boys at the turn of the 20th century in Akron, Ohio. So David Marine set up two groups of school-age girls, a control group of 2,300 students. No iodine was given. A treatment group of 2,100 students, 9 milligrams of iodine average daily for two and a half years. What side effects did he report with over 100 times the RDA for iodine? None. What did he find? Look at the control group studies. 22% goiter. The treatment group, 0.2% goiter. Now, Marine quickly repeated those studies in Michigan, found the same results. Um, within a few years, they introduced iodized salt to the Midwest. Go uh, four years later, goiter decreased by 75%. The United States quickly added iodine to salt for the rest of the country. It was hailed as the first public health miracle, which it was. Adding iodine to salt caused goiter rates to markedly decline. Um, and really, the end of, of the interest in iodine came about because of this. World War II came, then patent medicine took hold, iodine was an inexpensive, non-patentable substance, and everybody thought we were getting enough in salt because people weren't getting goiters anymore. So here's a map of World War I recruits, about 1917 or so, and you could see the whole country is suffering from an iodine deficiency problem, and the black is the worst, but really from east to west, north to south, the whole country is suffering from a, an iodine deficiency problem because everyone's got goiters, and these were mostly men, um, so this wasn't even reflective of the women. This has been going on a long time in our country. So how do you adjust iodine? It's not very common in most foods. Um, it is in some ocean foods and ocean fish and sea vegetables. Um, it can be found in food products if iodine is added to the food source, such as salt. So it took, a, it took the U.S. nearly 100 years to add iodine um, to salt to follow Booz and Galt's recommendations. Now, what about iodized salt? It has 74 micrograms of iodide per gram of salt. It's a very cost-effective way to prevent goiter. Um, however, I say it's inadequate to provide for the body's need for iodine. And this study really proves it. It's done by Pittman. It was done in the 1960s. He looked at two groups. Group 1 had iodized bread. Group 2 had iodized salt. They were both given 750 micrograms per day of iodine in both groups. And from that amount of iodine coming in, you would expect the serum level when they do a blood test should be about 17 micrograms per liter. But what Pittman found was that in the blue is the expected, which was pretty close to 17 micrograms per liter. The bread group came up right where it should, so people got enough iodine from bread. Look at the salt group. Only 10% of the iodine in salt is bioavailable. Salt's not even the best way to get iodine in the body. So why? Could it be from competitive inhibition by chloride in salt? Very doubtful. Our body has grams and grams of chloride that we use to pump, um, to fuel pumps, to make energy. We need chloride in our body. I don't think that's, that's doing it. But there's other things in iodized salt that are a problem. Ferrous cyanide, there's chlorine in it. I talk about this more in my book, Salt Your Way to Health, and in my lecture on salt. Um, but once you learn about iodized salt as a poorer substance, a de devitalized substance that should be avoided in our diet, um, who would still recommend iodized salt? Unfortunately, there are many doctors who do to get your iodine in. And here's three of them, Drs. Howard, Dr. Fine, Dr. Howard. Um, but if we toss Drs. Howard, Dr. Fine, Dr. Howard out of the mix and you start learning about salt, you'll realize that um, you need to add iodine to your diet um, and take in unrefined salt. Here's my book, Salt Your Way to Health. Um, again, I reiterate to you, 
If you're not taking an unrefined salt, you are salt deficient, and it's very hard to maintain your optimal health when you're salt deficient. So just to remind you, iodine levels have fallen 50% in the United States over the last 30 years. Just as Ricky asked Lucy what happened, you should be asking yourself what happened and what are the consequences of this. Well, during that time, iodine levels have fallen 50%. We've had increases in all the thyroid illnesses, as well as cancers of the hormone-sensitive tissue, the breast, the prostate, and endometrium, and ovaries. And all those conditions can be caused by iodine deficiency. At our office, the first 250 patients that I tested, 94.7% tested significantly low in iodine. Here's where the first 24. You can see here that two people met sufficiency above that red line. Now, one of them was my nurse, Denny, number five. We're going to talk about her. But two out of 24 met it. Here's the next 26, zero out of 26. That means two out of 50, which is about 96%, were severely deficient in iodine. Now we've tested over 4,000 patients. By the end of this year, we'll be over 5,000 patients. And our results have shown 96.3% have tested low via urine and or serum testing. It's consistent. Almost everybody's low in iodine, unless you're taking iodine. So why? Well, the soil's deficient in iodine. It's known to be deficient in the Midwestern areas and mountainous areas, and that's from glaciers, deforestation, and forest farming techniques. But the main reason is pollution. Pesticides and insecticides contain bromide and fluoride and chlorine, which all inhibit iodine. It's a national and a worldwide problem. There's not much iodine in food, as shown in this slide. Um, so hopefully by now, again, we've seen this slide a few times now, the 50% decline in iodine levels. Why has it happened? So why are people iodine deficient? Well, people don't use salt, number one. They're all afraid of getting hypertension. We've been conditioned that salt equals hypertension, which is the farthest thing from the truth. Um, even refined salt does not cause hypertension in the vast majority of people, but unrefined salt certainly doesn't, and I use unrefined salt to treat hypertension. But less than 50% of U.S. households use iodized salt. It's probably less than 30%. Radioactive iodine use in medicine can only work in an iodine deficiency state. Um, chemical exposures. This is the main reason people are deficient in iodine and more deficient and why we require more iodine. They're called goitrogens, the bromine, chloride, and fluoride. They're in drugs that contain fluoride and bromide. Almost all the drugs that have been recalled from the market over the last 10 years, I would say, I'm, ge I'm just guessing on this one, but I would say well over 50% have a fluoride or a bromide molecule attached to them. Now, these molecules competitively inhibit iodine as well as decrease iodine uptake. There's declining mineral levels in general in our soil, but the main reason is diet. One of them is soy. Soy is the cheapest crop to grow in the United States. It's a known goitrogen. It causes swelling of the thyroid. Now, soy contains compounds that inhibit thyroid peroxidase. And these compounds are daidzine and genistine, which are commonly found in supplements you'll see on the health food store shelves. I would say you should avoid these as supplements. And when low iodine levels are present, soy compounds block TPO catalyzed tyrosine iodination by acting as alternate substrates. And they produce chemicals that we shouldn't produce in our bodies, mono, di, and triiodo soy flavones. Now, that's a mouthful, but these compounds worsen an iodine deficiency, and they can only occur when there's lower intermittent doses of iodine, which is what most of the population is taking in. I suggest to you avoid non-fermented soy-containing foods, soy milk, soy dog, soy cheese, um, and soy supplements. It does not include the fermented forms of soy, miso, and tempeh. So what are the other dietary reasons for iodine deficiency? Diets without ocean fish or sea vegetables, inadequate use of iodized salt, vegan and vegetarian diets notoriously deficient in iodine, especially if you're not taking in sea vegetables, bromine in food and drinks. Some Gatorade products, Mountain Dew, and other soft drinks contain bromine. These need to be avoided. Bromine is a substance that inhibits iodine in the body. And bakery products, bread, pasta, cereal, now they all contain bromine. But let's ask the question, what happened to bakery products? In the 1960s, iodine was added to bakery products as an anti-caking agent. One slice of bread contained the RDA for iodine, 150 micrograms. Somewhere in the early 1970s, bromine was substituted for iodine due to misinformation about iodine. I've searched for why this took place. I can't find it. It occurred right at the same time conventional medicine began using iodine in all their medical tests. And that doesn't work if you have adequate amounts of iodine in. Maybe there's a correlation there. But what did the substitution of bromine for iodine in the early 1970s do? And they substituted it in breads, pasta, cereal, all the, baking, all the products made with flour. Well, it creates a double whammy in the body. It worsened an iodine deficiency problem already present in the United States, 
adding competitively inhibited iodine in the body by adding a goitrogen bromine to bakery products. I say it's the most asinine act amongst many in the history of the food industry. So this gentleman saw my lecture. He's the CEO of Bubba Grump Shrimp Company and a very wealthy man who self-made uh, multimillionaire. And he says, stupid is as stupid does. What do you expect when we make our population iodine deficient and then we throw in these toxic goitrogens, bromide, fluoride, chlorine, and um, soy into our diet? We're going to make things worse. What about bromine? It's a toxic substance with no known value in the body. It's in the family of halides. Um, all those halides compete with one another for absorption and receptor binding. And we know that bromine interferes with iodine utilization of the thyroid as well as other areas of the body. It's a known goitrogen. It's known to bind to wherever iodine binds to, the breast, prostate, the thyroid. Now, we had a patient who was doing very well, was sick when we first saw her. She was doing great for a couple of years, and all of a sudden, all her symptoms come back. She's fatigued, she's achy, brain fog, she gets anxious, um, and we can't figure out what's shifted in her. She saw my lecture, and I showed this slide. And this slide, this slide shows the different chemicals in a new car. The steering wheel has three parts per million bromine. The seat is 2.5% made of bromine. Um, the shift knob, 333 parts per million bromine. You know, it's all over these new cars. That's what that smell is when you go into, uh, you know, when you sit into a new car. Part of it is the chemical smell of bromine. Um, she had just gotten a new car and when her symptoms started. So we, she gave her car to her husband. She took the old car. Um, we detoxed her. It took about four to six weeks. All her symptoms went away. And needless to say, I don't think she's going to be getting a new car in her lifetime. Um, so the halogens, fluoride, chloride, bromide, iodine, these are all chemically related to one another in the same family. They can inhibit one another's absorption. They can bind to one another's receptors in the body. Here's the molecular weight of the halogens. Here's the size of the halogens in this next slide. If you're going to use one halogen to inhibit iodine, which one are you going to use on this slide? You're going to use the one that more closely resembles iodine, and you can tell what it is. It's bromine. And the bromine has a closer molecular weight to iodine. Therefore, it's more structurally similar to iodine. Um, animal studies show that bromine intake can adversely affect the accumulation of iodine in the thyroid and the skin. And higher bromide intake results in iodine being eliminated from the thyroid gland and replaced by bromide. And ingestion of bromine has been shown to cause hypothyroidism in animals. In fact, when you get thyroid hormone levels, T4 and T3 levels, how can you be assured that those T4 and T3 are four molecules of iodine, three molecules of iodine versus bromide? You can't. Our conventional testing doesn't allow for that. Yet we know it can happen in the body. So when iodine deficiency is present, the toxicity of bromine is accelerated in the body. Where do you get exposed to bromine? It's an antibacterial agent for pools and hot tubs. It's a fumigant for agriculture. And it's sprayed on fruits and vegetables, and those crops are found to contain high bromide levels. It's also a fumigant for termites and other pests. In 1981, 6.3 million pounds of bromide were sprayed in California. By 1991, 18.7 million pounds of bromide sprayed in California. Where is this bromide going? It's going to our food supply. When you pesticide your lawn or insecticide your lawn, you're using chemicals that contain bromide and fluoride. I encourage you to stop doing it. You're poisoning the environment, poisoning my lawn, and I don't use that stuff. Now, my lawn may not look the greenest to you, but um, who cares at this point? We're in this economic crisis and this health care crisis, and, um, you know, we don't need golf course green lawns, and it's certainly not worth our health to do that. Bromine's been shown to decrease sex drive in the sperm count of mice. It enhances estrogen receptors and decreases progesterone receptors. There's 33% less male births in women with the highest exposure to pesticides containing bromine, PBDEs and PCBs. Now, this was done in my office. Um, and I do iodine testing in my office and bromine testing. Every patient that I have tested for bromine has been toxic on bromine. I've tested well over 500 patients now. We, overall, between sending it out for labs, we've tested over 1,000 patients. Every single patient, healthy, sick, doesn't matter what they have, toxic levels of bromide. Now, the ones who are sick usually have higher amounts than the ones who are not sick, but everyone's got toxic levels of bromide. So these were 32 patients taken at random. So out of these 32 patients that I tested in my office, um, you can see we did a pre and a post iodine test where you take, we did 24 hours of urine collection, then they took 50 milligrams of iodine, then they collected another 24 hours of urine you would expect the iodine to kick the body's bromide to come out. 
So what you can see here is that the pre and the gray, um, their levels of bromide were high, all of them. That was a, this was a mean, but they were all high above that yellow line. When the post, after they took iodine, they went up 50% on average. So the body was able to start detoxing from bromide. Here's the iodine part of the test. Everyone was deficient in iodine at the pre-level and at the post-level. Um, they should have normal, should be about 45 milligrams here. And so they're about half, you know, 50% deficient in iodine for these 32 patients. What about pesticides? We know pesticides contain organic bromine, and the amount of bromine in human breast milk has increased tenfold over the last decade from the EPA. Now, this is a 42-year-old male. This was me um, and my iodine tests over time. And you can see here that um, normal should be 45 milligrams. And you can see over time, from taking 50 to 75 milligrams of iodine per day, my iodine levels were going up. Um, and I was starting to approach normal in October of 04. Um, but you can also see, look at my bromine levels. In the pre, before I started iodine, I was near toxic levels of bromine. And Dr. Abraham was doing this test for me, and he, he was calling me after he did this initial test, and he said, Dave, I think you're drinking Mountain Dew or something. And I said, I don't drink Mountain Dew. Um, he says, well, you're getting exposed to bromine from somewhere, and we couldn't figure out where. Um, but what I finally ascertained was I ate a lot of fruit and vegetables, and I'm assuming that that's where I'm getting this from. But really, it was taking of iodine, which caused my bromine levels to decline over time. What I found was I felt good beforehand. I feel good afterwards, but my brain is much sharper. Um, and I never had brain fog, but I just I thought I felt good before taking iodine. But boy, my brain really sharpened up with iodine. I think it was from this bromine detox. So to get 600 micrograms of iodine across the cell and into the thyroid gland, you need the serum concentration of 10 to the minus 5th to minus 6 molar. You can't reach that at the RDA for iodine. It's impossible. You'll never get the levels up high enough in the blood to do that. But 50 milligrams of iodine can reach a 10 to the minus 5th molar concentration in someone who's healthy in about 3 to 6 months. Someone who's sick, breast cancer, prostate cancer, ovarian cancer, thyroid cancer, autoimmune disorder. It can take them sometimes years to reach that level. But only iodine can do this. Now, how much iodine is stored in the body? Here's the thyroid we talked about, at 50 milligrams per day at saturation. The breasts, a minimum of 5 milligrams per day. That's for a 110-pound woman. However, a larger woman or a woman with larger breasts requires more iodine. Men have smaller breasts and a smaller iodine requirement. The other glandular tissue, a minimum of about 2 milligrams per day. And we, we went through this slide. Every cell in the body contains and utilizes iodine, but it's concentrated in the glandular tissue. And here's how to check the levels. You can do blood levels, saliva levels. Um, you can do skin testing. You rub iodine on the skin, and you observe for its disappearance of the yellow color. Um, but it's, it's a really inaccurate test. And studies have shown about 88% of the iodine evaporates from the skin. Um, the theory is that if the iodine goes away within 24 hours, your body's sucking it up and you're really deficient in iodine. I say it's, it's a lousy theory and it doesn't really hold much weight. The best measure is urinary testing. And the, the, the iodine loading test is what Dr. Abraham developed. That's what we use. Either that or a spot iodine test if you're not taking iodine. And here are the two labs that can do an iodine loading test. Um, both labs do a good job with it. And um, I suggest before taking iodine, get your iodine levels checked and work with a knowledgeable healthcare practitioner who can help you with this. So we know iodine is present in every cell of the body. Many different glands and cells concentrate iodine against the gradient. It's carried by this train called the sodium iodine symporter. One atom of iodine into the cell, two atoms of sodium transported into the cell. Now here's Nurse Denny. In the orange here shows um, the mean of six female patients who took 50 milligrams of iodine and what happened to their serum levels. And you can see it went up and they peaked about two to four hours, and then it gradually went down over 24 hours. Denny in gray, she peaked about one hour, and by three hours she's pretty much down to zero. Now, Denny was that one that was above the reading on the first 24 patients in that slide. When Denny took that 50 milligrams of iodine, she got side effects, she was irritable, she got a headache, and she had palpitations, and she said, what are you doing to me? And she was my nurse, and she works a full day on Tuesday, and she was yelling at me all day, and um, it was not a pleasant day. But here's why Denny was feeling so bad. Here's her bromine levels, and you can see that time zero, before she took bromine, she was at near toxic levels of bromine, just 
just in her bloodstream, just walking around. When she took the iodine at time zero, you can see one hour later, it goes up about 25%. And now she's at really toxic levels of bromine. No wonder why she feels so bad here and she's yelling at me all day. Now, Denny still finished 11 hours. She's still high in bromine. So what we did with Denny was we ascertained that she was bromine toxic, that she was probably iodine, she was iodine deficient, and now Denny wouldn't take iodine. She felt so bad she didn't want to do it. What happened was she was detoxing from bromine, and that was all her side effects. So what we did was we gave her vitamin C as an antioxidant to stop the oxidant load that bromine was causing in her body, and we gave her salt, about 5 to 10 grams per day, which is about a teaspoon to, teaspoon to two teaspoons of salt a day, and unrefined salt a day. And then we rechecked her six months later. And what we found, here's her curve now. And her curve matches that normal curve. You can see here from this slide. And she got the iodine in slower and she felt better. Now, she didn't get quite the symptoms she got here. She still got symptoms from iodine. Denny has continued with the vitamin C and the salt. She still won't take iodine because she remembers how she felt. Um, but she feels a lot better on the bromine, I mean on the vitamin C and the salt. And um, I'm trying to convince her now to do some updated studies for us, but I'll keep you posted on that. So when problems with iodine use, think detox, vitamin C, salt, water, liver and kidney support, exercise, clean up the diet. All that helps with bromine. Tom, 42-year-old nurse of mine, he initially started with 12 and a half milligrams of iodine per day. He increased his dose to 50 milligrams per day um, because he was, he was feeling better at the 12 and a half but still feeling a little bit tired. What happened to his ratio? Well, when we could do a saliva serum ratio, you could see his ratio at 12 and a half milligrams was very low. At 50 milligrams, he pretty much gets a normal saliva serum ratio of iodine, which is what you would expect when we increase his iodine. But what happened to his bromine? Next slide shows his bromine was toxic at the 12 and a half milligram levels, but not as high as Denny, who was in the hundreds. But at the 50 milligram level, look what happened to his bromine. It went up significantly, so his body's able to push more bromine out. Now, Tom felt good. He didn't get sick. This is the difference between people. For those that get sick, they just need more support and more detox support. Tom didn't need quite as much support, and he felt better with it. So I hope I made the case to you about iodine and how important it is. And there's much more than this covered in my book. Um, and, you know, I wanted to scratch the surface and tell you to start thinking about iodine, start reading about iodine. You can look on my website. I write a blog that I publish at least twice a week. Um, it's www.drbrownstein.com. Um, but I hope I've given you thought on iodine and... When you, when you look at iodine, what I want you to realize is that the RDA is inadequate to supply the body's need. The dosage must be individualized. And use a combination of iodine and iodide. And there are two sources of iodine that I recommend right now. Op, uh, Iodorol from Optimox or Iodozyme um, from Biotics. And both of these are available in my office. Um, they're both adequate sources of iodine. You can also use Lugol Solution, which is still available. But most importantly, do appropriate pre- and post-testing and work with somebody that's associated with iodine. And I hope that I've convinced you that medical iodophobia is unwarranted and we can call ourselves cured from that now. So the final thoughts. Iodine deficiency is common. It's not rectified by the use of iodized salt. And iodine deficiency may be the underlying cause of autoimmune thyroid disorders. Using a combination of iodine and iodide is more effective than using iodide alone. And the best results are achieved with a holistic approach. Vitamins, minerals, diet, detox, hormone balancing, magnesium supplementation, salt supplementation. And remember, it's impossible to balance a hormonal system w without iodine sufficiency being present. And that includes the thyroid and the adrenals. And the whole body iodine sufficiency generally requires higher doses of iodine than what the government tells us from 12 to 50 milligrams per day. So I'd like to thank you for listening to this talk. I hope I've given you something to think about. And I hope that you will take a critical look at your iodine intake and your iodine levels. And by ensuring that you have adequate iodine intake, you too can achieve your optimal health. Thank you.